is not trying to start or continue a currency war. He's trying to end the currency war. The currency war has been going on since 2010. That's what my first book was about. Hello everyone, our guest, Jim Rickards, explains that if Western countries seize Russian assets, Russia could sue EuroClear, the largest clearing, settlement, and custody organization in Europe, to recover damages. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. So my question to you is how likely do you think that scenario would happen that we would be pushed towards going back towards a gold standard? Highly likely, someone, somewhat likely? I, I would say more, more likely all the time. It? More likely all the time because of the stupidity or blindness of the Biden administration officials. And here, uh, let's talk about the effort to steal Russian assets. Now, at the outbreak right. of the, the Russian special military operation in Ukraine, at the start of that, the U.S. froze the assets of the Central Bank of Russia. Yes. Almost unprecedented, not completely, but but almost. Uh, about $300 billion of U.S. Treasury securities owned by Russia. That they had, they had surpluses, they had dollars, they invested the dollars in U.S. Treasuries. They had about three hundred billion. They're all they're all uh, digital uh, book entry. There's no there are no physical treasury securities you could put in a vault. Haven't been since 1979. So this is a digital ledger maintained by the Fed and the and the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury. And Russia had about three hundred billion dollars of treasury securities. So we froze them. Freezing them just means okay, they're still Russia's securities, but they can't use them. They can't collect the interest. They can't pledge them. They can't repo them. They can't sell them. Uh, et cetera. They're just, they're kind of frozen, but they still belong to Russia. Now the U.S. wants to go a step further and seize them, actually convert the title, turn it over to some trust fund for the benefit of Ukraine. Uh, and, and actually they say seize, I say steal. So they want to steal the Russian assets, the $300 billion. Now we have a G7 summit coming up in about two weeks, June 13th to 15th. It's in uh, Apulia in, in Italy. Um, they've been working on this for over six months, but this is uh, two weeks from now. So we're in a countdown mode, uh, Daniela, um, at the G7 meeting. They want to formalize what they're going to do. Now, there's several different proposals. One is just to seize the whole $300 billion. One is uh, to issue a, a $50 billion bond issue backed by the Russian assets. So, you know, uh, of course, Ukraine would default on the bonds and the creditors would seize the assets. It's just a backdoor way of stealing the assets. Some people say, well, they'll just steal the interest. It's about three billion a year. So there's about six billion of interest piled up. So there are different things in play. We'll see what they actually do at the G7 meeting. But they all they're all the same in the sense that they involve stealing these Russian assets. Now, it doesn't mean that the next day the U.S. Treasury market collapses. There are, you know, forecasts like that. Some people get a little hyperbolic. It doesn't mean that. I mean, the the Treasury, one phone call to Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan and tell them to buy U.S. Treasury notes, and they will. The banks will do what they're told. So, but here's here's where the system could collapse. Uh, first of all, Putin would retaliate. Uh, there are well over $300 billion of, dollars of Western assets in Russia. Um, you know, BP, uh, Chevron, Shell, major U.S. oil companies, uh, Starbucks, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, you name it. And they haven't, uh, a lot of those businesses have kind of pretended to get out of Russia, but the assets are still there. Franchises are still there. Russia has not expropriated them, but they could. They could take all those, uh, and they will. Uh, Putin has said, he, he well, the thing about Putin is he doesn't bluff. He thinks very carefully about what he says. And when he says something, He'll do it, and and he has. So uh, if the U.S. steals the Russian treasuries, Putin will expropriate Western oil and energy and natural gas assets and just give it to Rosneft or Gazprom, which are the major Russian uh, energy companies. It's estimated that there, it's it's estimated that there are more Western assets in Russia than there are Russian treasury bonds in the West. So Putin could actually make a profit on this this whole thing. Uh, but uh, but here's the the other play that. 
you know, it's clear to me because I'm a lawyer, but no one else has even discussed where are these assets? There's only about five billion of the 300 in U.S. banks, and those can be t stolen very easily. But over 200 billion are in Euroclear. Euroclear is the largest clearing, settlement, and custody organization in Europe, um, and it has over 40 trillion dollars of total assets, you know, stocks, bonds, other types of securities, et cetera. But it has these uh, 200 billion of the 300 billion of Russian assets, U.S. Treasury securities are in Euroclear. Now, if you seize those, um, Euroclear has offices around the world. They have offices in Bahrain, uh, UAE, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, rep office in Beijing, et cetera. Russia could sue Euroclear in any one of those offices, and just take Hong Kong, for example. Hong Kong is an interesting case. It's under the thumb of the communist Chinese, but it kind of walks and talks like a Western legal system. They have lawyers and courts and all that. So Russian lawyers show up in Hong Kong, sue Euroclear for $300 billion or more, you know, with damages, et cetera, uh, and get a judgment in favor of Russia. Russia can now run around the world and seize Euroclear assets that belong to anybody. Uh, to recover that judgment. You could throw a monkey wrench into the entire global clearance and settlement system by disrupting, wow. by disrupting Euroclear, which is probably second only to DTCC in terms of settlement and clearance. So this is an example of the stupidity of U.S. officials. Oh. Johnny Ellen doesn't understand any of this. Her deputy, Wally Adiyamo, doesn't understand it. But the, the real danger is not that the treasury market collapses the next day. That could happen over time. It's that Russia retaliates, right. gets a judgment, and freezes the entire Western clearance to settle in the system. Now, you would think that one official would have thought of this, Jen. I, I can't think of I cannot think of an example uh, going back years where the U.S. has been able to think two moves ahead. They're just not that bright. I mean, uh, Blinken, uh, Jake Sullivan, J Janet Yellen's a statistics geek from Berkeley. She doesn't understand this. Her deputy, Wally Adeyamo, he's smarter. He understands sanctions law, but he doesn't know anything about business. He's never spent a day in business. He spent his whole career in the government, and then he was uh, president of the Obama Foundation. That's not exactly uh, you know, what I call market experience for, you know, for a couple of years, then went back into the government. So they, they just don't understand it. I mean, I, maybe I've been in international finance too long, and I do have two law degrees, so I do, th I do think about it, but I would... I would have thought that others would have figured this out, but apparently they have not. Punishing uh, countries that will be moving away from the dollar. I mean, they're, they're obviously actively thinking about this, right? I mean, like government officials, uh, maybe they're not two steps ahead, but they must be a little worried about what the weaponization of the dollar has done. So uh, curious to get your thoughts on uh, President former President Donald Trump's economics advisors, which were con considering ways to actively stop nations from, ways to actively stop nations from shifting away from using the dollar in effort to counter uh, budding moves among key emerging markets to reduce exposure to U.S. currency. Um, so if he does come back into office, I mean, this is something that his economics advisors are already looking at. Uh, but is it too little too late, Jim? Uh, no. And just to your earlier point, Danielle, about, you know, the surely the U.S. officials must know this. They don't. I mean, I, I, yeah. I met with the, I met with senior treasury officials. I've been in the Fed, the White House. I've sat at the Pentagon with, you know, two, one person away from the senior treasury official with responsibility for uh, the dollar, uh, dollar relations in, in Asia. And I told them exactly what I just told you. I mean, uh, you know, in, in different scenarios. And they, they don't get it. They bang the table. The U.S. is dollar is the reserve currency. It always will be, et cetera. They're really blind to this. Uh, so I wouldn't, count on them being able to, to see through it. But coming back to your other point, uh, yeah, it's a big deal. Now, the, the, there's, there's the reality and then there's the story. So what's the storyline from, you know, the right. deep state and the mainstream media and all that? <clears throat> there's, pardon me, they're saying um, Trump wants to start the, the currency wars and he wants to weaken the dollar, you know, to promote U.S. exports and export-related jobs, et cetera. Um, and, uh, so that's, that's the kind of, like we're supposed to worry because Trump's going to destroy the dollar. Um, first of all, it, it's not true. That's not what he's doing. Trump is not trying to start or continue a currency war. He's trying to end the currency war. The currency war has been going on since 2010. That's what my first book was about. 
Uh, but I also said in that book, that book came out in 2011, I said, currency wars, we're not always, we're not always in one, but when we are, they can last 15 or 20 years. So here we are 2024. I'm not surprised that, you know, 13 years after the book came out, we're still in a currency war because I said, that's how long they can last. And we are. So it's not a new currency war. It's, it's been the same one that's been going on for, you know, as I say, 13 years. So, um, but what Trump's trying to do is end it. His model is what Ronald Reagan and James Baker did at the Plaza Accord in 1985 and the Louvre Accord in 1987. So what was going on then? Uh, coming out of the severe recession of 81, 82, 20% interest rates, Paul Volcker, et cetera, we finally got inflation down to about a little over 3% by 1983. Growth was really strong, 16% uh, compound growth between 83 and 86. The dollar hit an all-time high. If you look at the Fed broad trade weighted index, the dollar hit an all-time high in 1985. Baker and Reagan, Baker was Secretary of the Treasury at the time, just said the dollar was too strong, and they didn't want to trash it. What they wanted to do is get together with Japan, Germany, because remember, we're still in the euro. Sorry, this is before the euro. So you still had the Deutsche Mark and the French franc and sterling and yen and all that. They met at the Plaza Hotel in New York. Uh, they had a conference with the foreign, with the uh, finance ministers and they agreed on new parities. And they said they were going to intervene in markets to get to cheapen the dollar. But it was a controlled cheapening. And it was, it was, it was by agreement. It was by consent. And they did it. And then by 1987, the dollar had got weak enough that they said, okay, that's good. Let's lock it in. And they met at the Louvre in, uh, in Paris and they agreed, they set the new parities and they, they agreed to keep it there. And for almost 20 years, from 1987 to 2010, I guess a little over 20 years, um, that was the great moderation. We didn't have high inflation. We didn't have currency wars. Uh, the price of gold didn't do a lot really until around, uh, until after 2000. Uh, for other reasons, but you did have great currency stability and that kind of blew up in 2010 after the global financial crisis. So the, the, by the way, the big brain behind this is Robert Lighthizer. Lighthizer was U.S. trade representative in the first Trump administration. He was deputy U.S. trade representative in the Reagan administration. He was around at the time of the Plaza and Louvre Accords. And what he's saying is we're not going to trash the dollar or destroy the dollar. He wants to have another sit down with the G7 members. And, you know, in theory, it would include they'd invite China and um, you know, Russia or other large economic powers and, uh, and set new parities and move towards them. And it might involve a slightly cheaper dollar, but it wouldn't be an outright war. It would be moving towards uh, currency stability. Now, here's the here's the twist. Um, you're invited to this meeting and you can work with the United States to achieve these parities. Uh, parries, but if you don't, right? If you don't, if you're if you're using excess capacity and you're dumping and you're trashing your own currency, then we're going to hit you with tariffs. So your choice is going to be join this currency club, which modeled on the Plaza Accord, or we're going to slam you hard with tariffs, which Lighthizer did to the Japanese. That's how he saved the U.S. auto industry in the in the 1980s. Japanese were taking over. They put high tariffs on Japanese cars. So. Uh, so this is not a currency war. He's trying to end a currency war. He's trying to achieve stability um, and do it cooperatively. But if you don't join the club, you're going to get hit with tariffs. So, so yes, you can see that coming. Say, so who are the winners in that? The winners are people who invest in the United States and workers. Uh, the losers are people who are, you know, betting on China uh, or, um, uh, you know, getting their money out of the United States. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Jim Rickards. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.